Welcome everyone to the third webinar in our Democracy Rebooted series, which has been co-organized by the American Political Science Association Democratic Innovations Group, the ECPR's Democratic Innovation Standing Group, which is led by Nicole Corrado, and the PSA Specialist Group for Participatory and Deliberative Democracy, led by Danica Fuss, Hans Asenbahn, Sonia Busu, and Anastasia Delicchiari. Uh, my name is Idena Bove, and I am the president of APSA's Democratic Innovations Related Group. Uh, and today we're just beyond thrilled to present Beyond Adversary Democracy, which is the finale in our fabulous three-part series. Uh, however, before I introduce our uh, speakers today, I just wanted to give a very quick plug for our APSA's Democratic Innovations Group. Uh, so which is newly formed. So our uh, Democratic Innovations Group is still accepting paper and panel proposals for the 2021 APSA conference. So I strongly encourage you or um, if you could motivate your students to submit your proposals soon, that would be fantastic. Um, I also encourage everyone to join us on Twitter at APSA underscore Dem Inno. Uh, and finally, if you're a member of APSA, you can officially join the related group. Uh, it's free for APSA members. Okay, so for today's webinar, uh, I'm honored to present uh, Jenny Mansbridge and Christopher Paul Harris in conversation. Um, Jenny, who really doesn't need any introduction, is the Charles F. Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values Emirati, uh, Emeritus at Harvard University and, of course, the author of uh, Beyond Adversary Democracy, a book that was directly informed by Jenny's involvement in 1960s activism and participatory organizations. Um, like Jenny, our conversation partner, Chris, bridges academia and activism. So Chris is currently a postdoc at Northwestern and has played an active role in the Black Youth Project 100 and is a co-curator of a dedicated section on the movement for Black Lives at the Museum of the City of New York. Chris's forthcoming book is entitled To Build a Black Future, Blackness and Social Movements in the Time of Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Um, so without any kind of further ado, I will uh, pass the mic on uh, to Chris. So if you'd like to lead us now in conversation. Great, thank you so much, Idana, and um, it's wonderful to be in community with uh, everyone on this call and in conversation, conversation with you, Jenny. Um, let's just get started, right? Um, so Jenny started working on the book in the late 60s uh, during another turbulent moment in American history, to say nothing of the rest of the world. Um, can you spend a few minutes to get us going, reflecting on what your goals for the book were at the time and the relationship between those goals and your own political commitments? Jenny, are you muted? Sorry about that, Edna. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say first uh, that although we're in a time of tumult and um, activism now, and we were in a time of tumult and activism then, I see a big difference between the two times and then in that then we were motivated by hope. Um, and we just really thought, the sky's the limit, you know, the civil rights movement had happened, the women's movement was happening. It looked as if we could bring about change. Lots of us were using the word revolution. Um, I think now a lot of us are motivated by fear um, that that both of them create activism, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a different vibe. Um, so, um, yeah, it seemed I was very involved and very worried about the participatory collectives that I belonged to uh, and that my friends belonged to um, because they were falling apart. And we really believed in participatory democracy. We wanted to break with the hierarchy of the past. And so to see our collectives breaking up with so much acrimony and, um, you know, falling apart was was hard um and so i thought well i've just moved into this new professional political science i was in history um maybe surely this whole discipline has got something that can tell us about how to do this better you know and i didn't find very many lessons in what i was reading in the literature about how to how to do what i considered real democracy 
uh, better. So um, I thought I'd go out and and look at some successful participatory collectives and see if I could uh, bring the lessons home. Um, that's not exactly the way the book turned out, but it started out as a self-help manual. That's the, that's the goal. That's, that's, that's fascinating um, on a couple of levels. Of, first of all, this idea of a, of a self-help manual, the practical implications of the discipline being, or the uh, findings or implications of the discipline being directed towards on the ground um, action is, is amazing. I want to take a step back though towards something that you were saying before about this current moment versus um, the 60s. Uh, while I definitely agree that it's a moment of fear and, and I might even say for some despair, I think the uprisings uh, over the summer, not just here in the United States, but a, a, around the world suggest that it isn't just Sorry, I got muted. Um, it isn't just fear and despair uh, that, that people are feeling. I think that there, while it may not be hope, I think that there is a lot of, of energy and determination to create a better world um, than the one that we live in right now. At, at least I can see that for uh, driving the movement for Black Lives, not just over the summer, but uh, over the last seven to, to eight years. Um, but yeah, I agree. Those words, energy and determination, are really right on. And um, and I also think that uh, you know, each time the movement is always driven by um, young people. And one of the great things about young people is is they got they've got hope. <laughs> you know, we've all got hope, like in our DNA, and that comes out much more when you're young. You, you know, you. You don't see the limitations, and um, so so yes, I think that's absolutely right. Hope, determination, and energy um, now too. But the background, instead of being one of a background in which possibility is written with a kind of capital P, um, there's sort of doom written with a capital D, you know, <laughs> like climate change and you know, and and racism raising its head again when we really maybe some of us thought kind of it was just no longer cool to be racist. Um, and so those things seem like backsliding and, and worrisome, really, really worrisome. Right, uh, I'm, I, I understand and, 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 and agree that at, at least over the last four years, we have definitely seen a more open and overt um, articulation of racial resentment um, yeah. and general antagonism. Uh, c going back to the the self help manual yeah, yeah. idea behind behind the book, um, can you can you say a little bit more about that and the relationship between that goal, a self help manual for um, participatory democracies, and and your political commitments? Oh, and my political commitments. Well, uh, you know, um, I, my dad's English and he left England because of the class system. So I never spelled America with a K. You know, that I mean, I never saw America as just evil bad. I saw America as a place where everybody could wear blue jeans, where you couldn't tell immediately from your accent, um, what class you were in. Now, you know, there's, there's race in, in there too. So we, we could talk about that uh, in America. But, uh, but, but so I saw, I, I felt, I just was brought up to feel that America was a place of equality. And I also grew up in a town, a meeting town where we ran our own town. So that was, I didn't see why, why that just wasn't possible. <laughs> and, um, and of course, you know, in the 60s, everyone was trying to change everything. Ben Barber is a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, uh, lots of people were, and in the women's movement, we, we were adamantly against the kind of hierarchy that we'd seen even in SDS, you know, even in the, even in the left-wing movements, it was the men who ran things and the women who did the typing and, 
And it was the heavies, the movement who kind of got up and did their thing, you know, and, uh, and we didn't want any of that. So we were, I was really immersed in a feminist anti-hierarchy. I don't know, I don't want to take too, take too much time about this, but just on the reminiscence front, a woman from New York came up to do a thing on the Boston Women's Movement for Life magazine. And she, she was actually staying in my attic. I had a little attic bedroom that's a teeny little apartment, um, but she was staying there. And um, she wanted somebody to be on the cover of Life magazine. She wanted a person to be a woman in the movement. And she couldn't talk any of us into doing it because we didn't think one person should. And she was really frustrated. She said, you know, this is a this is a huge opportunity. This is Life magazine. You're gonna go all over the United States and you're saying you're not nobody's gonna, you know, she was very angry. And we just said, no, no, you know, so she had to do some sort of composite woman on the cover, because nobody would would do it. And that's the kind of that's what I was immersed in. And I believed it was possible, and I still believe it's really possible to to downgrade the hierarchy, not to eliminate it, but to downgrade it. But so that's the, that was, those were the commitments that um, I had then and uh, um, I have now. Yeah, the uh, non-hierarchical uh, aim, I think is a central part of today's movement as well. Of course, being anchored in, in black radical feminism, um, the, the goal of kind of pushing us to a logic that, that not only doesn't place um, to the best of one's ability, uh, one over another, but also uh, really recognizing how people are differently positioned in the way that we interact with each other. Um, totally, and that 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 little bit that you just said right then, recognizing the difference, that's I think a real advance beyond where we were in the sixties. You know, we could come back to that maybe. Yeah, uh, and and I'm and I'm sure we will. But that, actually, this gives us a, a good segue in a sense because it's been 40 years since the book was first published okay. um and i'm 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 wondering uh how if at all uh, have your views changed since then and if they have what brought about uh, the shifts in your thinking yeah well that's what i was thinking of when you you actually shot me um a, a, you know that question um on the email it was i'm gr really glad you did because um, it, it allowed me to think about it a bit, uh, thinking, thinking of it ahead of time. Um, so I think there are ways in which my views have not shifted at all. And that's that I think that every democracy has got to meld into it self, both the adversary and what I call then the unitary components. I never liked the word unitary. I, I was building out of the relationships of friendship, um, but those friend, relationships of friendship are egalitarian. They're mutually respectful. They aim at consensus, but they don't require consensus. Um, so um, I thought, I, th I think we need these common interested elements and we need the conflicting interested elements based on conflicting interest. And we got to figure out not only by organization by organization, but issue by issue, how we're going to handle that balance. And I felt at the time, I felt that we were, we in the movement were borrowing from the nation state, a model of conflict, because at the nation state level, democracies, a lot of conflict, that just didn't match what we were trying to do in our collectives, which was a lot common interested. And then when I went and did the study of the town meeting, I saw, gosh, you know, there were a huge number of common interests there too. And this took actually uh, 10 years to kind of, <laughs> it wasn't like I, it, I just got these insights. I, I was really puzzling out about, and maybe if we have time, we could even go into how that all, there was a sort of, in, 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 my, in my interviews with a, a group that I called um, Helpline. Um, those people helped me help me see this whole common interested, conf conflicting interested thing. But so I thought we were really taking that adversary model and putting it on our on our collectives, and it wasn't working. Um, and um, so I thought, okay, you know, let's 
the, the big lesson, the two big lessons that came out of the book were one, recognize how much common interest you have and how much conflicting interest you have and don't like treat, treat them treat them appropriately. Don't don't treat one with the mechanisms for the other. And then um, the other one was about this issue we were just talking about hierarchy. Um, You know, it's okay for there to be unequal power at some times. And those times might be when you have common interest. So look, if I have common interest with you, if we're driving to Boston and you wanna to go to Boston because your sister's getting married, I wanna go to Boston because I've got something here. I can fall asleep in the back seat. I don't have to have any power because I know, completely know, I mean, you could turn around and go to chat and you'll give it, you know, chances are practically zero. So I can just fall asleep. So in moments of common interest, it, you don't have to have power to, to protect your interests equally. And, and if the other big reason for having equal power, equal power reflects equal respect. If in certain circumstances to get the respect. And then, and the third one is that if, if you have a situation where some people are just doing everything, the other people just atrophy. They, they atrophy in their, in their development of activism, they atrophy in their development of their skills. They, you know, um, and so you want to, you want everybody to be growing. This is the Rousseauian point that you, you grow through democracy and you want everybody to be growing um, but you know in a in a collective where there's a ton a lot of things to do most people are growing <laughs> you know most people are growing so hard so fast they'd like to grow a little less fast you know thank you very much so when you've got all those things common interest and uh, and a place to grow and equal respect you just don't need equal power that much and so i was saying okay let's put down this template on on when you're demanding equal power. And when you've got really conflicting interests, man, that is a place to demand equal power. And when it's, when you see respect getting at, you know, some people are getting respect and others are just being treated like lackeys. Well, that's a moment for equal power. And if some people are just not being able to grow, that's, an, you know, so so let's put down that template. That was my kind of, and I haven't, I haven't shifted at all in that. <sighs> so, <laughs> Thanks for giving me the chance for saying what I haven't shifted on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, think, I think that general principle uh, of, uh, and it could be applied to other things, right? This, this idea of not mistakenly applying one model in, a, in an arena where it's inappropriate. And then, and then um, because it doesn't fit what you're trying to do or what you're trying to achieve, it um, minimizes the, the ability to realize what you're actually there for. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I think that's 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 a key insight. And so, if that idea hasn't um, changed, um, then then what 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 has? What has? <laughs> right. Well, a couple of things. One is uh, emphasis. Um, you know, right then I was saying, um, pay attention to common interests. Right then, uh, as I say, we were borrowing this adversary model, and also political science was. That's what it was. It was about conflicting interests. So um, it made a lot of sense at that point to be saying kind of, hey, you know, pay attention, common interests, you know, pay attention. Um, then came the deliberative democracy movement. And actually maybe picking up some stuff I did said in the book, um, but and there, the emphasis was totally on common interests. I mean, like Habermas uh, imp implying in his first book, saying more or less in his first book, that deliberation that's not just about the common good is illegitimate. Bargaining, et cetera, stuff I called adversary democracy, essentially illegitimate. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's, no, 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 you know. So, so I tried to write some stuff. There was that piece that I wrote, um, using power, fighting power. It, it came out first in Constellations and then in a book that Shayla Benavie uh, did. Um, 
and there was a conference, you know, the way these things always are in conferences. And my friend Bonnie Hane goes, because I was saying in that, using power, fighting power, I was saying that power is important, we should use it, it's good. We have to fight it at the same time we use it, but, but like, don't put down power. Um, and Bonnie came, came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I think you should have called that piece. I said beyond adversary democracy, but I didn't mean that far beyond. <laughs> And I thought that would that, that would have been great. I, I would have loved to have called it that. Um, so and 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 that's right. You know, it it was sort of saying, look, and and ditto um, self interest. The deliberative demo democrats at the beginning were very much against self interest, against bargaining and whatnot. And I got together um, some other political theorists, some Habermasians. But it, that's right. You know that that line. That, anti-self-interest was the Habermasians were saying it, the Rawlsians were saying it, the Civic Republicans were saying it, every strand of deliberative democracy was saying it. And I thought, look, one of the big lessons we learned in the women's movement was that women have been told always to put their families first and so forth. You've got to really, you've got to step back and actually try to figure out what are my interests? That's, that's important. Self-interest is important. It can't just be ruled off the table. And so we got a, a bunch of theorists and we wrote something on the role of, of uh, the place of self-interest and the role of power and, and, and deliberation. And that, so that's, that was again, kind of coming back at, well, look, let's, you, you need adversary democracy, you need self-interest, you need to pay attention to, to conflict. Oh, oh and so that, that would be a third one place to look. We just, a couple of years ago, did an introduction to the Oxford Handbook of Deliberative Democracy. And in that, we've got a table and it's got first generation and second generation standards for good deliberation. And we've shown how, how they've sort of evolved over time. And um, one of them, the old standard was seek consensus. The new standard is seek consensus and clarify conflict. That's what deliberation should do. Deliberation should also clarify conflict. If it turns out you've got some really major conflicts and you switch from a consensus mode to a more adversary mode. And that's, so that, that's a real shift in, in emphasis um, that, that I have. Great, yeah. And so, and so it would seem, like just piggybacking on, on some of those ideas that you've rolled out, that, that the same shift in emphasis uh, would have also played a big role in um, your other book, Beyond Self-Interest. Yeah, 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 that's right. So like, again, on the, on the Beyond Self-Interest book, I was saying, hey, everybody, there is self-interest, on self interested <laughs> behavior, there's public spirit out there, there really is, you know, and you can use it for democracy. I was sort of, it was like, I got political scientists from pretty much every field to write a chapter that said, Public spirited behavior is absolutely critical, even in international relations. I mean, and so field, 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 field. And then later, as I said, you know, I'm, I'm sort of switching gears and saying, hey, but, <laughs> you know, but self interest also good. So I think it's a question always of the, the tension, keeping, the, keeping your eye on both. If you're going heavily in the common interested direction, make sure, you don't go, make sure you're not sweeping conflict under the rug, you know? And if you're really embedded in the conflict direction, make sure you're not just forgetting some aspects in which you could forge some common interest. That's, you know, that's, I haven't changed on that. Mm. A both and kind of. Yeah, uh, both and. Where, but both where? and and tension, you know, not just lovely, lovely both and. Mm. Um, both and intention and, att and pay attention. So are there any places where your views have changed because of what you learned in your activism? Yes, yes. And um, I'm really glad you, you shot me something on, on that before, Hannah, because I want to read you something that I, I wrote in this is the Beyond of Erosurum of Democracy book. Um, so then I was talking about equal respect. And I said, um, I wrote, in the first flush of discovering their common history, women and the radical women's movement felt a tremendous sense of sisterhood. 
To feel that all women were sisters meant that all of their differences faded into insignificance beside the overwhelming understanding that they had, so to speak, grown up together, shared the same fears, troubles, ways of coping, humiliations, and joys. In the era of sisterhood, institutional reminders of the distinctions and inequalities of the larger society became intolerable. And um, so obviously I was talking about my own experience there. You know, um, that, 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 was a, uh, that was a feeling that I experienced and I experienced to this day. Um, but what I learned after that through the movement, through Black, black women, speak, Black feminists speaking out in the movement was, you know, kind of like, wait a minute, sister, <laughs> what's this all? <laughs> you know, those were not the same fears. They were not experienced in the same way. Was, they were not the same humiliations. And unless you kind of really recognize and track and acknowledge and try to, you know, bring that in and do something about those differences, your unity's a sham. And I, th I think that that was something that I learned, you know, through the movement afterwards. And I think it's something we're still all learning. It's not how to do that because it's not just um, black, black feminism within feminism, it's within black feminism, many differences and so forth. You know, there, we've just, I think that's a, a powerful lesson that we've learned since I wrote that book. Absolutely. And, and that thought, you know, I guess we were kind of hinting at it a little bit earlier, but that, that perspective and frame is, is definitely central in, in um, the movement for Black Lives. Today, uh, there are similar ways to the description that you gave about women and sisterhood um, that have plagued Black movement as well, um, as you su suggested, um, especially in that time when, uh, you know, the uh, emergent black feminists of the day were wrestling within the context of black movement um, with getting particular issues that were uh, important to their experience um, tethered to the idea of black liberation so i think that we definitely moved um, a lot further in that direction and uh, still have um, a long ways to go um, but we're yeah and that's where the the movement you know and i'm sure this is just what you've experienced too that's where the movement is experimenting you know we don't know how to do this. Exactly. So I mean, we're, I, we're trying. Yeah, yeah. The uh, word and so, is key. You know. what, what, what did you say was key? Uh, the word experimentation. Yeah. Feels yeah. Key. And I think um, that if you think of it as experimentation and you think of these as like heavy problems, that's going to be a good frame to approach it. Because cause that's part of the self-help bounty that I was trying to say was um, back in the day, um, was that if you if you approach it in that frame, then when you screw up, um, you're you're not going to blame yourself so much because you know you're on a very difficult frontier here. You know how do you do this? How do you recognize difference and build unity? You know how, what are the ways of paying respect that that work? You know that are that 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 feel like respect to both parties, the person giving the respect and the person, quote unquote, receiving the respect, you know, how, how is that going to, how, how do we do that? We don't, you know, so, so if we see ourselves in the, in a, in a, in a mode of experimentation, then I think there's a lot less blame, a lot less self-blame and a lot less blame of others. That's, mm -hmm. that was a huge goal for me. Um, of course, <laughs> you know, actually it turned out only academics read my book, so the sort of the self-help part didn't necessarily get too far, but you know, it's still, it's, it's still, the, it's still the goal. Yeah, well, it's just on that, it's really, it's, it's really hard uh, to, I mean, I have the same ambition, um, not necessarily as, as, as self-help per se, I wouldn't describe it as that, but I certainly have the ambition for, for my work to, to not simply be um, fodder for academics, but make its way um, beyond that. And it's, it's a challenge for sure. It is, it is. So. Um, oh, go ahead. I just saw a little note from John Castile. John Pocky says, I'm skeptical that only academics read Beyond Adversary Democracy. I, I don't know who, who, who reads Beyond Adversary Democracy, obviously, um, but I'm still involved in very much less. I'm 81 years old, you know, 
um, but I'm still involved in in activist movements. I don't see anybody talking about democracy. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not saying, oh, um, you should read my book. Um, so, so maybe John, you're right, but but doesn't come across my my vision. I just like that your voice became so high when you suggested people read your book. I don't know what that means, but we'll interpret that somehow. <laughs> Um, switching switching gears slightly um, to 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 really uh, hone in on hone in on, on the present uh, the present moment and one of one of the features of, of American politics really since Trump's ascent um, has been a uh, it's a complete breakdown in norms uh, primarily carried out by Trump himself um, and a continued deterioration of uh, in, in trust which follows a larger pattern in public sentiment um, that that. Uh, political science has observed over the uh, last few decades. So, and we're seeing that, of course, pretty vividly right now uh, in the way Trump's campaign is not only contesting the election revo uh, results, but uh, really actively sowing doubt about, uh, um, about the dem our, our democracy as such, right? So does the idea of um, adversary democracy even make sense in the Trump era? And how might we recover some of the trust that had been lost in a post-Trump world? Yeah, those are the questions. Um, adver adversary democracy makes less sense when things are, uh, when the world is so full of hate and so full of animosity. Um, the, concept of adversary democracy after all it's based on one person one vote you know hey kind of like we have this conflict um so how do we deal with it we put it up for a vote well um <laughs> that kind of assumes that you can vote the people's votes are relatively equal therefore you know the outcome is going to be relatively legitimate therefore people are going to kind of buy into it unless they're a permanent minority there's reasons for them to buy into it because there's going to you know they may lose this time but they're going to win next time there's a a whole kind of scaffolding that adversary democracy is based on. And that scaffolding is uh, being whittled away in various ways. I mean, vote suppression, uh, votes aren't equal. Um, and I mean, they never were equal to, because of the electoral college in, in the US, but, um, uh, but the, the refusal, the taking of a healthy distrust and turning, weaponizing it into a, 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 a a rejection of the results of an election. Um, you can't do adversary democracy if you can't do an election. I mean that. So this is this is this is beyond adversary democracy in the other direction. You know this this is like truly hate filled. And I um, I'm hoping that you know now that we've elected Mr. Normal um, that there will be kind of a little bit of rethinking and a little bit of 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 you know just the way we were all in covid fatigue you know that there will be sort of trump fatigue um and that a lot of people will think you know you know it's really it's really good to get back to adversary democracy where we count votes and we we believe that our fellow citizens are not you know can be in the same country with us um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm worried and I'm worried for parts of Europe as well. Um, but where are the parts of hope? Well, there's some people on this call, uh, Thorsten and John, who've been involved and probably others who've been involved in the citizens assemblies where you, where you bring a random group of citizens together to talk for a weekend or talk for more than in the case of the Citizens Initiative in, in Oregon, Citizens Initiative Review in Oregon, much more than that. Talk, talk together and think about an issue, bring people together who are ran, randomly selected, so they're from all sides, but put them in a deliberative setting where they see one another's faces, where they, can talk about one another, where they can tell stories about their kids, where they can experience each other as human beings in the same world um, and see what they come up with. Um, you know, the Citizens Assembly on Brexit, which took place way after breakfast, Brexit, unfortunately, came up with, I thought was a really creative solution. 
um, but it was too late. Uh, but uh, the citizens can be creative, um, and they can they can help with these. The, the adversary process is, you know, the party process, particularly in a two-party system, is is designed to push push the parties apart, um, and that's true, especially when they get competitive. Francis Lee's new book, Insecure Majorities, is fantastic on that, showing that since 1980, when we got competitive, when, when the, the first time the Democrats lost control of the Senate in like, you know, 40, except for one time in whatever it was, 48 years, that whole period of bipartisanship we talk about, it's a period of democratic dominance, democratic party dominance. So, so when that started getting contested, then the parties went at each other's throats, particularly the Republican Party. But um, that's part of this. That's part of the system, and you gotta. It, it's got this internal dynamic of pushing you apart. So you gotta figure out ways of getting around that. And I think that these citizens' assemblies are are a way. I don't think they're a panacea, but I think I think they they do provide um, a pathway, a partial. A partially open door. It's really interesting to think about um, citizens' assemblies and think also about the way um, the pandemic has forced everybody to on on Zoom. And I've been I've been thinking thinking to myself, um, what what might Zoom mean for um, participatory uh, democracy or opening up pathways for for innovative ways to to engage one another over concrete issues I, I had this this idea um, along these lines and, and and this will also help me segue to, to my next question about how we might um, what it would look like to give people the opportunity to to, to, to imagine a brand new constitution if that was some kind of a prompt and you connected people across different spaces on Zoom or whatever through some portal where they might have an opportunity to actually lay out what their priorities would be if they had the opportunity to, to, to create it from scratch um, and, and kind of rethink our, 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 our institutions. Um, so on, on that note, I just wanted but, but, to- But to, to follow up on that, um... Yes, I think it's terrific, and I think it'd be terrific, absolutely good for younger people as well, because they're more familiar. They do lots of FaceTime on their phones, and they're very familiar with 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 talking. Um, but you know, one of the big problems in participatory groups is that poor people, people with less fluency, you know, less they don't use words so much in their in their work. Uh, you mean you and I. <laughs> Words are what we do. We, we go into the classroom. We use words. We will sit down and write books. We will write. We sit on Zooms when, like you and the way we're doing right now, and we're using words, and it comes supernatural to us. But it, it doesn't come natural to, to everybody. And um, and the people for whom it doesn't come naturally are the people that that, that we want to pay most attention to. So I think when we design these platforms and so forth, we've got to be really uh, incredibly attentive to the off-putting factor you know not just that somebody doesn't have access to the internet that's a that's a, a factor out there that may, sometimes we can you can get you know, they can go to the library or whatever um but um i went i was at a, a, a recent randomly selected group um uh, who met for a weekend and there was one young black woman there who never said a word except when they were introducing it never said a single word and at, at one of the breaks i said to her you know i you know i'm jenny mansberg blah, blah, blah. I, I i notice you're not saying anything is that cool with you you know and she said yes yes like thank you very much miss white person you know I'm not interested in your, I mean, I don't know what she was thinking, but the, the tone of the yes was, I don't want to go any further out with this. So naturally I didn't go any further with it. And the, we went through the whole thing and she said not a word. So now I don't know why she didn't say a word, but I bet that she had something to contribute, you know, and, and maybe breakout groups in which she was with two other people, maybe especially if she was with the two other black people in the group. I don't know. Would that have been 
would that have helped? You know what? Is this something that needs help? I think you have a right to stay silent. You know, I'm not, not everybody has to say everything. I'm just saying that when, when we have these ideas of, okay, let's bring everybody on Zoom, not everybody is like you and me, kind of pretty comfortable with it. And, and, and even me, I'm not that comfortable with it. I mean, I had this, when we were setting up, I was sort of, saying, I've got this thing on my lap and I was trying to say, oh, you know, am I getting the, you know, uh, I was nervous coming into this thing, you know, and heck, I'm 81 years old. I've been teaching my entire life. So anyway, that's a big, that's a big play to anybody on this Zoom. If you're, if you're, if you're doing this kind of citizen engagement, really be extremely sensitive to what people are telling you the more vulnerable and the more marginalized people what they're telling you about your instrument what they're they're telling you about the way you're going to go about it and and see if you can engage in some kinds of asking because some people are not going to uh, just take the initiative and come up and tell you you're doing it wrong so anyway so that's no, I, I really feel strongly about that that's so that's why i wanted to grab that it's it's a, it's an important point, and it's it's a point that applies whether we're talking about Zoom or even in in person um, uh, deliberative forums, uh, and and that's why it's important, and and this is a, a key feature or a key um, part of of movement politics today is to um, center the historically marginalized in everything that you do. So think from and listen to their experience to inform the way you design democratic mechanisms yes. to, or a public policy, the way you, um, you know, carry forth the meeting. Um, on, on and that, that's new, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't a mantra that we had back in the women's, we did have the mantra, listen to every woman. But right, we didn't right. have that mantra about have it come from the more marginalized. And that's that's really a part of this last movement. Black Lives Matter has been really important in that. And so, and, and um, speaking of the marginalized, on, on that note, we, we uh, the past four years have uh, also brought more widespread scrutiny to the undemocratic nature of our democratic institutions. And for some, um, a deep skepticism about whether we live in a democracy at all. Um, for many black, brown, and other historically marginalized folks, this skepticism is nothing new, right? Um, some, and, and I include myself in this number, go as far as to say that actually existing democracy and the way it's embedded in and committed to uh, anti-blackness, uh, white supremacy, uh, capitalism and uh, heteropatriarchy uh, is, is ultimately incapable of tending to the needs of those situated furthest from power. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think our democratic institutions can serve, can actually serve the most vulnerable among us? And if so, uh, what needs to happen so they more consistently do so? Yeah. Well, I agree that, you know, um, right now, November 23rd, 2020, um, we are embed. Our democracy is embedded in anti-blackness, white supremacy, uh, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, um, and that doesn't mean to say it can't do anything. You know, um, Ob Obamacare is weak, but it's better than what was there before, and it did have parts of it that really benefited the more vulnerable. Um, even the, the CARES Act you know, had lots and lots and lots for very rich people, um, but some stuff for the, the vulnerable. So it's it's not that we can't do anything, um, but I, I, I agree that about that embeddedness. I think that that embeddedness is different for each of the forms that you mention. I think that heteropatriarchy is the easiest actually not to get rid of because uh, I don't think my, my grandchildren, my great great grandchildren, my great 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 grandchildren will see the end of patriarchy. But, um, but, but to reduce, reduce to, to very small amounts. Because, you know, um, women are parts of, of fam, uh, elite women are parts of elite families. They have lots of power and they have, and, 
and the people with power in the families are are engaged with them very deeply. It's a very it's 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 a it's a very deeply embedded thing. And and ditto um, gay people, transgender people. They're in families. They're in the elite circles, um, and so they have uh, more access to power. Um, I think that um, anti-blackness, white supremacy, is harder, and I think it's harder in part because um, it cross cuts so so deeply with class. It doesn't cut much less recently, of course. I mean that's changing. It's changing, but also and and also locale that black people often live in and around black people. And that's going to be very, very difficult to change. And a lot of people are not going to want even black people are not going to want to change it either. It's very complex, but it means that the levers of power are not so close as they are for for women, for example. Um, and I think capitalism. I don't think we're going to see the end of capitalism. I think we're going to see different varieties of capitalism, and in the and I think some of these varieties of capitalism are going to be easier to change than others. And I, th I think we can tame capitalism. I think, I think, you know, um, the, I think, inter I don't think that international labor organization is a, is, is a crazy thing to think of for the future. I don't think that treaties um, that have built into them protections for workers in developing countries, as well as protections for workers all over. I don't think that's a crazy thing to 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 to, to um, ex expect in the future. So I think it, it will be take struggle and so forth. But uh, uh, I think a tamed capitalism is is possible. But I I think I, I don't see a world, democratic or otherwise, that doesn't have some significant capitalist features. Like look at China, you know. Um, so, but that doesn't mean to say we can't make democracy better and i think we've been talking about the ways we can make democracy better and um you know my, you're at northwestern right my friend ben page is at northwestern and he and marty gillens has, have got this book called american democracy question mark and they've got a whole ton of uh suggestions in there running from financial reform to get to help get not to get money out of politics that's a, when they're not going to do that but to help mitigate the worst of money in politics, lobbying reforms, um, all the way to you know getting rid of the electoral college and maybe redoing the Senate, um, but but other other things, universal voting. Um, uh, actually, I wrote down a list. What the heck is that list? Yeah, I can find it. But, um, uh, I wanted to make a list. Here we go. The list from their book, from um, Democracy in America. Um, yeah, abolishing primaries. Oh, ranked choice voting. You know, I used to be very much against ranked choice voting because it undermines parties. Um, but now with the polarization in the United States the way it is, I think we, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing because it's, it's needed. Um, so all of those things, reducing polarization will help us get legislation through Congress. Um, and that's necessary given, I mean, the rank, the checks and balances that my students love checks and balances. I normally hate checks and balances because uh, they've produced gridlock, 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 gridlock in the United States for the last, since 1980. But um, we needed them when we had Trump. Turns out, good old checks and balances, you know. Um, so given that, polarization is, if you add polarization to checks and balances, you get no legislation, not no legislation, but it's harder to get legislation. And that's the legislation that helps vulnerable people. Um, so people who don't want to help vulnerable people are very happy to have no legislation at all. Thank you very much. You know, the government could disappear as far as they were concerned. Um, they're just sitting pretty. Actually, if the government disappeared, they wouldn't be sitting pretty because it, it wouldn't be things that would protect their positions. But anyway, you know, what I'm saying is that that, um, that that this is a struggle, but we can, I think we definitely can improve democracy in lots of ways. Improve, yes. Uh, I, I myself um, share some of the skepticism that you have about, um, you know, rooting these dominating forces out of the system entirely without 
tearing the whole thing down and what it would mean or look like to do that, I think is a matter of values or, or even an ethics. And if there's a way- Maybe to... it's also a, va a matter of what you think is possible. I just don't think it's possible to tear things down deeply uh, right away and not have, I see, I've seen too many participatory democracies, collectives fall apart. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I Occupy felt, I didn't, if you, we haven't yet figured out the alternate system. Um, and so I'm, you know, deeply worried about trying to like get rid of what we've got when we don't, we're not really sure what we've got to replace it. And I think experimentation is great, but experimentation is a matter of trial and error. And there's error in the trial and an error. <laughs> and the errors can be catastrophic if you're dealing with the whole system. Um, and the errors were pretty catastrophic when we were dealing just with our collectives. The collectives, how many participatory collectives do you see around now? You know, how many bicycle collectives? How many law collectives? I mean, they've all, that was a wonderful moment. It seemed to me half of Boston was running on collectives for a while. You know, not, that's an exaggeration, but a lot of them. I hear you though. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm just going to interrupt the conversation oh, now. Okay. Sorry, just for the sake of time, and we can go a little bit over because we started uh, five minutes late. So, figure we'll turn. We're just our... hanging out together and, and talking. Okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, if people don't have to run off, we can stay and chat. Uh, and I will start. I will take advantage of my position, and I'm going to start by actually asking a Chris uh, question to you, Chris, and then I'll let you take over and uh, field questions from the audience if you'd like. But just going back to as you guys were just talking about this question about building. Um, a more democratic future. And I wanted to relate it to Chris's first question at the beginning to Jenny about the differences between previous movements and this movements. And Jenny, you said that uh, you felt one of the big differences was that uh, in the 60s, you're motivated by hope, whereas now it feels like people are motivated by fear. Uh, and Chris, you pushed but back. But add to that the energy and determination that Chris uh, mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Chris, you pushed back. And I, I just wondered, Chris, if you wanted to speak a little bit about this like question of hope and fear in relation to uh, social movements today, especially uh, Black Lives Matter. And if you could speak to that for a sec. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess I guess I would say that that in in a sense, both of those words, hope on the one hand and, and fear on, on the other are almost um, the altogether the incorrect terms in, in at least how I interpret um, uh, the movement and, and what has driven it. I mean, we know in the beginning um, it was the, you know, hyper visibility of black death and the inability for it to, or at least as it appeared and as we have seen it confirmed over the years, the inability for the law um, and for justice as such to be applied to the extrajudicial killings um, in the name of the law um, of, of, of young black folks. And so I think that it was pain and rage at first, right? Um, uh, but there's also a lot of joy. Um, there's also a lot of um, excitement and celebration of, of, of black life. Of, uh, of, of black culture, of being black, that also drives um, the push to imagine a different world and try to implement practices. And this was towards what I was gonna say to you before, Jenny, is that, you know, it's not nothing, change isn't something that happens right away. You're not just gonna tear things down right away. But what you can do is organize around, uh, around a set of values that are antagonistic to uh, anti-blackness, uh, white supremacy, um, heteropatriarchy, and capitalism. Um, and I think that's what the movement is doing and what it's trying to galvanize people around to organize uh, and, and be excited about the possibilities of, of practicing um, uh, the world that we want to see in the here and now in the hopes that at some point those practices, those ideas, the circulation and organi organizing around those values takes hold strong enough that we can start to scale up the things that we've been practicing on on a more local level. Yeah, yeah. The, the word that, that was used in the movement um, in the 60s was prefiguring, um, to try to prefigure the practices you want. That's a very fancy word. But the, what I'm picking up and what you're talking about, it was the joy. Uh, I think, you know, I, I, when I talk about it being based in fear, 
if a movement doesn't doesn't have joy in it, it's it's not going to work. And um, I, as you were talking about about that, and your whole body came to life, um, I I got it, and that's the way it was. That's the way it was uh, in the women's movement as well. This sort of sense of um, of 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 sort of um, glorying in yourselves. Oh my gosh! Look, we can we can do this stuff. Sorry, my alarm just went off. Um, so yeah, that joy. I think you can't have a movement without that. That the the energy that you spoke of and the determination that you spoke of earlier is um, has to be undergirded with some joy, has to be. I agree with you, and that that might be forgotten. Thank you. And uh, so I'm just going to look in the chat, and there's a couple people who have questions. So we'll start uh, first. I think it's Gianluca, and then Oliver and Hans. And if other people have questions, you can type it in the chat, and we can go go through. So uh, Gianluca. Do you yes, want to okay. unmute yourself? Yes, yes. Um, hello there. Hi, hello, Jenny. Um, I, I do have a question. As a, activists and academics, in order to actually make an impact, we need uh, a proper political science working. I was thinking, um, Brexit was completely out of the blue. We didn't forecast that to happen. Uh, Hillary Clinton losing uh, the pollster got it wrong again. And with uh, Trump, well, we weren't sure if um, no, Biden was going to win. And I got also, as an Italian, I work in the UK, a very strong example of the Five Star Movement two years ago, 2018, won the election completely out of the blue. No pollster, no one got it right. We are talking about they actually forecasted 5%, roughly, you now a kind of percentage you would get, and they got 25%. Uh, completely you know, blow up completely political science. So we want to make a change, but how can we in this kind of scenario where we can't get it right? Well, I, I agree with you that polls um, are not uh, very accurate these days, and I think they never were. For First of all, they're much less accurate these days because at least in the United States, you're getting single digit responses. I mean, 9% or something will answer a poll. Well, that, and you can weight that 9% all you want, but it's not going to be actually a representative sample. Um, but back a long time ago, um, there were, were much higher percentages, sometimes 80% responding. Um, but even then, it depends on the questions you ask. So for example, um, no survey organization asked the question, do you consider yourself a feminist until 1986? That was after the, Equal Rights Amendment, the, you know, the fe feminist movement began, you know, in the 70s. 1986 was the first time any survey organization asked, do you consider yourself a feminist? So the survey organizations um, are made up of, you know, people in survey organizations. They, are not, they, they don't have their ear to the ground. They don't know what's going on. Um, and so they're not asking the right questions often. And so naturally, they're not going to be picking things up. And also the people who don't respond are are, even when I did my very first study back in, um, in this little town in the 70s, uh, 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 I went around from, town, from door to door and I'm a sort of sweet, I was a graduate student, you know, hello, hello, knock, 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 I'm Jenny Mansbridge and I'm, I'm you know. Um, the one person who didn't answer the survey was conservative. You know, um, she thought I have my, my position and I'm, I don't see why I should be telling any young woman who comes to the door what my position is. Well, I didn't kind of need her response because I also had a lot of public, uh, I had a lot of data from the, t from the town. I knew, I knew about her, I knew actually about her property taxes and I knew whether she'd, how, how many elections she'd voted in. Uh, so I, and um, so, so it, it didn't sort of bias the sample, but I made the metal note, oh, okay, this is, this is one kind of person who doesn't answer. Another kind of person who doesn't answer are really poor people who can't be found, or even if they are found, they don't, they don't, you know, they don't know whether you might be the police. If they're undocumented, you know, they're certainly not going to talk to anybody. So there's a, these, these samples even, you know, just not representative, and they're not going to, and the questions are rarely open-ended. They're almost all closed-ended questions. They're never, 
because it's too hard, too expensive to, um, to code open-ended questions. So a question like, well, sort of, what do you think is really important in politics today or something like that? Survey organization is not going to ask that kind of question. And it's out of that kind of question that you're going to get the clues for what's really going on. And that's the problem with surveys as such, where uh, they just don't, they just don't <laughs> capture a lot of, and can't capture necessarily because of the way that they're structured, some of the vital um, uh, details that might um, give us a better idea of where people are coming from. I know it's improbable and, and, and too expensive, but I would love for more qualitative um, um, methods to, uh, like the work that you did, Jenny, and, and like that I, that in my research, to, to really kind of pull out where, where people are at. Um, and, move and not away. just where people are at, but where people actually find themselves at through, talk, through talking with you and, and through thinking through the answers to the questions you ask them. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if I have time, but right at the end of my survey, my interview with the helpline people, um, I gave them a piece of paper um, with uh, circles on it, bullseye. And I said, okay, if this is the center of power, and I give them little pieces of paper, each piece of paper had a, the person, a name of a person on it. Could you, could you just distribute the names of the people in the organization around this center of power? And I was doing it in order to get a power number for people. But it turned out that the very process of, of putting those names down in an unequal way, and oh, and then I taped them, I scotch taped them down. And that was a real reification. And that turned into a revelatory thing for people to kind of say, you know, I don't like this exercise. Um, or, and I said, you know, or I'll say, are, were you comfortable with that? And they'd say, yeah, I was comfortable with that. And I said, well, why are you comfortable with that? You've just been telling me how important equality is to you and you've just shown me an unequal organization. How, you, how come you're comfortable with that? And it was out of that, the answer to that question, how come you're comfortable with that, that I got the whole idea for the book. So it, it, you know, there's a, there's, there's creativity. It, I mean, it's not just finding out where they're at because where they're at is fluid and, and may change when they try to think about where they're at. Certainly I, I, I change when I try to think about when I, where I'm at. Anyway, that's a really, I'm just glad you said that. Can I very, very quickly, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Jan, Luca, sorry, no, we actually have a big list of questions and we're going to sorry, I'll, I'll be much quiet, quicker next time. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so I think we'll go down to the next question from uh, Oliver Escobar, which was typed into the chat. So if you don't mind, Oliver, I'll just read it. Uh, and the question is, what kind of democracy can address the climate emergency and ecological breakdown, i.e. effectively and fairly? <laughs> a more contemplative democracy, a more deliberative democracy, a democracy where people get to sit back, step back and think about the effects on future generations. Um, and I think that that requires, you know, the, the, the UK has had um, having this, uh, has had this um, citizen assembly on climate change, France, um, other places will do that. Um, where this the kind of democracies we have are, are not built very well for looking for for registering the um needs uh long term long term needs um we have to think very creatively about how to change democracy what do you think Chris? yeah Chris, actually does this speak to what you were saying earlier about the role of capitalism and whether incremental change is possible yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say we, we are not going to be able to address the climate crisis uh, based on democratic institutions that are driven by notions of property and self-interest subsumed under under capitalism. I mean, we can we can, you know, international community can make goals that they say will help the process, but those measures are nowhere near being good enough, uh, and it's unclear to me whether. Um, uh, the pressure being put on governments by um, grassroots movements in the United States and around the world are are, are strong enough to come to to to, to overcome the kind of um, institutional um, sedimentation that's informed by interest, property, and capital.
I think that's a great point. Um, thank you. So now Hans, do you, you have a question as well? Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks, Jenny and Chris. This was so inspiring. Um, so Jenny, when you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, in the 80s and 90s, there was such a wonderful surge of feminist democratic theory. There was, you know, Carol Pateman and Phillips, um, your own work, of course, all Iris Marin Young, all these wonderful people. And um, there was so much important insight gained for democratic theory in general. You pointed to self-interest, obviously, the politics of presence, and all these concepts that are really driving a lot of debates today. Um, so uh, my question is, what is the role of feminist democratic theory today? Do you think there is still a need for a new generation of feminists to engage with democratic theory? And what might be the issues that should drive, you know, feminist democratic theory, particularly today? I can't say what issues drive it because the whole point of new theory is to put new issues on the table and I'm not in it. I, mean, I, 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 um, I think that one of the good things about the theory part of political science is it is quite open to, to new ideas. It's trying to kind of make sense of the world in a more, uh, in a more theoretical way. Uh, and so it's, so it's open to, to new ideas. So I can't say what, what feminist theory today should do. Um, I, I think you know, plumbing difference is important. But I also think that we shouldn't, I think we shouldn't worry that there's sort of waves of innovation in a field and then there are other waves. I think right now you're seeing a really big wave in um, writing of pe by people of color. And th that's where a lot of new ideas are coming from. And I, um, now it'd be just great if new ideas were coming from everywhere. And I think there's a lot of cross fertilization. I think a lot of the best ideas in, in, in new feminist theory are coming from the cross fertilization and the interlock, you know, intersectionality, um, and what the come, what come by heat river collective called interlocking character of a lot of oppressions. Um, so, so that's, you know, that's got a lot of, still got a lot of life in it. But there may be some, you know, we didn't predict the civil rights movement. We didn't predict the environmental movement. We didn't predict the feminist movement. We didn't predict the gay movement. I can't predict where the where new ideas are coming from. What what we want to have, and I think what we do to some degree have in in um, in 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 the democ in many democracies today is an openness to social movements. And from those social movements, from the interaction and social movements, that's where a lot of these good ideas are coming from. They're not coming from people sitting in, uh, in front of a whole bunch of books, like the books in the back of me, and sort of reading the books. They're, they're coming from the people who are out there experiencing the joy that Chris talked about and, the, and experiencing these new ideas and saying, yes, you know, this is right. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to take it and I'm going to, I'm going to try to find what its essence is and so forth. And since we can't predict what movements are going to come, come along next, I, I think we can't predict what ideas are going to come along next. I think what we can do is to create a receptive space. And I, that's one of the reasons I'm so happy that the, APS, the American Political Science Association has got this new democratic innovations related group because it's an open space where somebody who's coming out of the movement right now and trying to bring into academia, bring into, bring, bring, not academia, not really, bring to the rest of us the ideas that they're picking up from on the ground. That's, that's what we can do. We can be receptive. Um, that's all we can do, I think. And I'm not, I'm not kind of worried that, oh, well, you know, X, Y, Z, and I'm certainly not going to predict what feminist theory ought to be in the next uh, week, month, year, decade. You know, that's going to be what happens from below. And I'll just thank say you for the question. I'll just say briefly. Um, I, I think I think we are seeing right now um, where where feminism um, and feminist theory is going. Um, and on, and it's black radical feminism as articulated and, and espoused in, in and around the movement. And yeah. while the reference there might not be, you know, Carol Pateman or some of the people that you mentioned, Hans, there's definitely a um, intellectual tradition um, that that movement is building off of. And it's mainly been black 
female thinkers and, and, and male thinkers within the black radical tradition. And one of the innovations, I think, in movement for theory, for us to grapple with is, is um, this, you know, an ethic of, of care. And I know uh, Joan Toronto, you know, worked through that in some ways, but it's much, much different as it's articulated in the, in, in, in the movement, much more about people. I mean, care is underneath this centering of the most marginalized. Care is, uh, is underneath looking for non-punitive ways to adjudicate harm. Uh, care is um, behind the need to uh, recognize generational trauma uh, and and heal from that, and so I think th this is an it, this is a a practiced praxis theoretical innovation in driven by uh, black feminism um, that uh, should be and can be put in conversation with some of the theoretical paradigms, Hans, you, you were you were bringing up before. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Thank you. Um, and possibly building on this, I think we have a question from uh, Ricky. And then, sorry, and then I think we'll take the last question from uh, afterwards from Anmal, who posted in the chat. But Ricky, if you go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thanks for an interesting discussion. Uh, so this is a question to both of you as well, I think. And so one thing that came out clearly, Jenny, in uh, what you were saying is that you think sort of deliberative mini publics are potentially a, a useful thing for improving democracy. Um, and whilst I agree that they are useful um, and that particularly for the kind of polarization issue that we see in the US at the moment, um, I do wonder to what extent you and both Christopher think they are useful for realizing things like racial justice uh, and sort of the realizing the interests of minority groups. In particular, I'm slightly skeptical, partly because I've never seen any minority group advocate for a deliberative mini public. Um, so no one in the racial justice movement, no one in the disabled people's movement, no one in like poor poverty movements and so on. They seem, they tend to be very skeptical of these, um, these kinds of mini publics. And if you think about it, it's kind of quite obvious why, because you take a marginalized group and you put them in um, a kind of majoritarian space in which they then have to challenge their own sort of forms of discursive, the already existing forms of discursive inclusion. So do we actually sort of realize these forms of care that Christopher was just talking about, for instance, when we put them into these sorts of spaces and are they a realistic way of um, yeah, challenging these forms of injustice? I'd be really interested in what both of you think about that question. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, we're in a period of experimentation with these um, citizen assembly kinds of groups, deliberative mini publics, um, and we'll have to see. Uh, um, I have, I, I was able to um, participate in America in one room recently, about a year, a year and a bit ago, um, and. I've never seen so many people on motorized scooters in my life. Um, you know, there was one, the, the eating place was on one floor and the, and the conference room was on another floor and there were escalators and elevators. But of course, elevators can only take really one motorized scooter at a time. And there was a long, 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 long line of mo motorized scooters. And I thought, I thought this is good. You know, um, but you're completely right that these issues have not been front and center. And if they were front and center, what are you going to find? I, I find quite a lot of care in these groups, um, particularly if they're organized in a way that the group has some kind of common project at the beginning. And, and many, many ones are organized that way so that they, one of their common projects is for the group to develop a set of questions to ask that. Uh, experts and have other um, that develops an ethic of care within the group, a very palpable ethic of care, um, so that you see people and and people will people will you know s someone who has very little money might start to cry and um, see you don't understand how it is you know um, have somebody say something. Uh, insensitive and not meaning to um, and then 
and then the person who's who they're right there across the table and they now know this person a little bit and they say you just don't know how it is and as i start to say that they start to cry um and that you know we're human beings we when 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 someone's in pain we it pulls out just um i think instinctively uh, some and uh, uh, some care so the these these settings could be settings that uh forefronted care but they also could be settings that in which as you suggest the majority might kind of dominate and so i think we have to experiment and we just don't know wonderful question it, it, it is and I'll, I'll just briefly follow that um and say actually if you if you think about what um black movement has always been demanding and is certainly being um, demanded now through the movement for black lives, community control. Like if you just think about these sort of um, ways of pushing for, say, defund the police, for example, people focus so much on the fact that it's anti-carceral state and wants to eliminate the carceral state, and that is there, of course. But there is also a desire to ask local communities our communities, if we have access to these resources from the carceral state to the community, let's think collectively about what we would do. How can we imagine safety differently? Um, what, what kind of uh, resources do we want to put into social services or uh, education, right? So I think if you like read between the lines of what um, the movement for black lives for example is pushing for with things like defund the police what you're really getting is an opportunity to experiment with with um with uh, uh deliberative forms on the local level because ultimately if the demands are met that communities have more control that um uh, our government is divesting from uh uh you know, institutions that cause harm and putting those resources into community and letting community, local communities, make decisions for themselves. What that is um, um, ultimately would end up in, 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 in theory, is more spaces where more people were engaged in deliberative decision making. So you're right to say that, you know, the, um, the, uh, it's not structurally set up to, to say be a place that eliminates um, uh, racial disparities and hierarchies in movement now. I think this emphasis on local control and community control and, and specifically thinking about how to use resources and how to imagine different um, mechanisms to use those resources is, um, might prove an opportunity for us to experiment with different modes of deliberation. Just a, a quick note on that. Um... Community control didn't work 100% well when we were do, work doing it in the, with the long, what's called the long 60s. Um, and because it often meant that established community leaders or new community leaders moved in and kind of used the organizations for their own purposes. So I think as we move toward community control, which I completely want also, um, we have to do it differently from just empowering existing community organizations or creating new structures where that are, are local rather than state-based. We, we have to have some innovations and, and some one innovation might be something like these citizen assemblies at a local basis, but I don't know. We haven't tried that. That's an experiment. Um, but some some ways of, of, of kind of keeping local leaders from just grabbing uh, grabbing the reins and and using these organizations for their own purposes. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay, and so we have one final question from Anmal, which is in the chat, so I'll just read it. And I think it actually, it kind of goes back to Gianluca's first question about um, methodology and political science in relation to uh, understanding some of these questions we're talking about in these social movements, but I think it also actually might tie in uh, pretty nicely to what just Chris was just saying, and Jenny as well, about different ways of imagining uh, what we could do, um, of how communities can imagine what they would, how they would enact uh, power at the community level if they had control over these resources. 
Um, so Anmal asks says on the note of qualitative dimension of polls and democracy, what are the opportunities um, that storytelling offers in gauging power relations uh, and working and the working of citizens assemblies, for example? Uh, so that's a question both actually, Chris, if you want to start us off. So the, the role of storytelling maybe in kind of understanding our situation. Well, I've seen storytelling to be a really powerful way, especially within um, in, in organizing spaces as, as it's played out, storytelling has been a, a really powerful way to make people or, or uh, give people access to an understanding that might not have been theirs prior. Um, uh, and that the kind of experiential interaction that happens with storytelling as a narrative form, as a way of, of potentially pulling people in, um, uh, really, I think, gets at this thing that we've been talking about throughout. This is understanding and respecting of difference in a way that, you know, pulls us away from our normative assumptions or what we think others might want to have hap to, to happen um, uh, or what kind of um, policy prescriptions or democratic structures are, are good for everyone. When you start to hear people tell their experiences uh, uh, and then communicate those experiences beyond a, a certain group, you get, I think, an opportunity to, um, to use difference and experience as the, ba as, as the basis for how you pursue um, particular ends rather than whatever was driving that perspective prior. Yes, I agree completely. Irish Marion Young was one was the person who put the word for storytelling out there in the theory front. Um, and but I think community organizers have known this for ever. <laughs> and um, we're since Iris, we've been been able to be much more conscious of the word storytelling and narrative. Large numbers of theorists have brought this brought this up. One thing I just uh, thought I'd just throw in is that the people who do qualitative work in political science have been thrown up, really thrown off by the virus. Um, you can't go out there and talk with people um, and, uh, you know, Zoom and Zoom, but that's not the same same thing as, as getting together with people. So many people, many people who do qualitative work have had their entire careers put on hold for, for, for a year um, and maybe it's going to be more. Um, I don't think political science has kind of reckoned with how this one group within our profession has really deeply been hurt by the virus. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but I do think that some kind of public understanding among departments who are giving promotions among the in the field itself. I mean, I, I don't know quite how you would do this recognition, but I think we have to recognize an entire year of people's lives has been taken out of their hands by the virus if they're in the midst of field, if talking with people, going out and talking with people. So it's just a, like th throwing that in. It's a, qualitative work is incredibly important, I think. And we've just, and there are fewer and fewer people in qualitative work, more or less every year in political science. Um, and it's a, a really sad for the field because it's so generative of thought. Um, and we've got to recognize that this has been a setback for people in that field. Don't absolutely. know what to do about it, but I want to get that out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that up, Jenny. It's definitely true. And I think also in a lot of um, sort of public engagement stuff too, in terms of having face-to-face -face interactions, it's really important for democracy. And I think in a time of declining trust um, and uh, you know, intergroup tensions, growing resent, racial resentment, it's really problematic that we can't have these face-to-face -face interactions and things are being siphoned online. So it's worrisome, but that will have to be the topic of our next um, webinar series, because I think we're, you know, we're about half an hour over time now and it's been a fabulous discussion. Oh. Well, thank <laughs> you all. Thank you so much for organizing this. It was fantastic. Oh, thank you so much for speaking, uh, Chris and Jenny. You guys were fantastic discussion partners and have given us so much to think about. Um, so yeah, thank you all and thanks everyone for coming uh, today. It's been a, it's been a great talk. Thanks everyone.